Hello everybody and welcome this week to Talking Flutes Extra with me, Jean-Paul Wright. As usual, a big shout out to our wonderful sponsors, TJ Flutes, for supporting us on our flute podcast journey. You can show them some flute love by visiting them at tjflutes.com or on socials on Instagram and Facebook at TJ Flutes and on YouTube and TikTok on Trevor James Flutes. Chris Bullock is a Brooklyn, New York based saxophonist and multi-instrumentalist. He has enjoyed an expansive career performing with a variety of artists across all sorts of musical styles. Most notably, he is known for his long time role as saxophonist and, I would probably say, woodwind player and composer in the genre bending ensemble Snarky Puppy. With this band, he has received four Grammy Awards and is often on tour around the world, performing at concert halls, to music festivals, to small rock rooms, in fact anywhere that can fit this sometimes very large band in. So I managed to catch up with Chris during a brief respite he was having in Rio just before Christmas. Do you find when you pop over to somewhere like Rio, the your senses you get an overload of everything because the colors the music scene it's not static we've seen that in the soccer with well, a soccer we call it football but americans call it soccer with the football at the moment is that when they score they dance it seems to be a natural mm. thing with brazilians yeah i mean i mean we experience the world with all of our senses and i and i always sometimes i forget about how much of like you know like smell is such an important thing and like when i went to the cup i landed here on I got into town, I got to, to Brazil like maybe four or five days ago. And just the first 24 hours, just like the smell of the city here in Rio and like very different because I was coming from New York, very different, just striking. And I was asking my friends, I was saying, I went to a Samba festival on Saturday. It was like the day of Samba here and, and like this one day that they celebrate Samba in Rio and they have this big festival. And uh, I was just asking these friends I was with like, do you guys, do you smell this? Do you smell this? And it, But it was just an overload, I mean, of, of my senses. Back to the football, though, the crazy thing about that, like when they, you said when they, when they score, they dance. Well, like the whole city erupts into like uh, cheers. So you can just like hear it reverberating across the city. Oh, wow. It's pretty special. Pretty fun. So I look forward to the next game. Chris, thank you so much for taking time out of your valuable break. Is this a genuine sort of complete break or are you using it as a to gather sort of inspiration or are you just going to see what germinates? I think the answer to your question is yes. <laughs> it's all, I, think it's, I think it's all of those things. I, you know, I came down here with some some goals. I'm here for two months, and uh, I have like some time between um, touring and, and things going on. And uh, I've had like a couple things in my life like shift around a little bit. So like right now, I'm kind of I put all my things in storage and I'm floating. And uh, so Brazil is like where I'm at for now. And after that, I, I'm not sure, but we'll, I'll figure it out. And as a creative, how's that making you feel? Free? Yeah, I mean. I've always been obsessed with like the music of this of this country. So I wanted to I've always wanted to come down and like spend some actual time on the ground here and like, you know, experience it. And I didn't really bring any clothes. I just brought instruments. So uh, <laughs> like a friend of mine who who is married to a Brazilian, he was like, you don't want to look like a gringo anyway. So just get the clothes when you get to Brazil. Just bring your instruments. So I brought like a little mobile recording rig. So I, I kind of have like a, in the back of my mind, I'm like working on a record right now, too, to, while I'm here as well. So like for myself so yeah well that's fabulous because we're going to cover a, one of my favorite bits of what, what you've done is your album but we'll cover that in a bit later but i'd like to take you back chris to the beginning the beginning of little chris where did your musical passion begin and when did it start i grew up in a pretty musical household my father plays guitar and my mom played piano and they, we all like I had to sing in church choir I was like forced to from like you know birth I also like had this like weird obsession with the Beach Boys when I was like four or five and had like every I won I like got my hands on every like I'm dating myself but I, every Beach Boys cassette I could find and it was I was just obsessed with the Beach Boys so that like early age obsession with music kind of started with that that group and that music 
and then from there it like went on to like piano lessons and I didn't really care about that I just like was told I would to do was going to do that and then eventually found my way to like saxophone and clarinet and guitar when you look at the Beach Boys was it that feel good vibe because when you listen to the Beach Boys it is so distinctly them yeah I think for me it's just like I, I just gravitate towards what I like to call sticky melodies and like just people that write these melodies that you cannot forget even if you want to and like you know Brian Wilson and his crew like n- really knew how to do that and uh, so I think like that that's kind of set the stage for some of my other musical activities and just like you know playing some little seeds things like that well you you try to intimate there that you're getting on a bit because you can remember cassettes but you're actually still a young person when it comes to the, the great thing about music is you're a musician for life and totally in that timeline you're still relatively a baby hence part of snarky you. snarky puppy puppy it's still not a dog yet it's still a puppy so how has your musical journey developed over the years and really who have been your major influences since you left home musical journey you know like i i, I went like the the college route and i and i got like an undergraduate degree and I didn't know what the hell I was going to do after that. So I was like, well, I guess I'll do more school because I do that well. So then I got a master's degree. And then after that, I was like, fuck, I guess I'll do more school. So I worked on a doctorate, but I never finished. All along through this, like, I feel like the school situation, the best thing about it wasn't necessarily the teachers. It was the community and the people I met along the way that I that I work with to this very day, you know, um, from my the various schools I went to. So like when I went to work on a doctorate in Texas at North Texas. That's when I met the snarky puppy dudes and started playing music with them. And then I started going down to Dallas and interacting with that musical scene, which was like had a really big impact on not just myself, but us as a band and, and a lot of musicians that kind of like paved the path, so to say. Well, we'll come to obviously snarky puppy in a minute, but before so, I, I want to speak about your debut album, Boomtown. I really adore it because there's nine very different tracks with different feels, vibes, and compositional messages. Where did you begin with that? Because, and how did you shuffle everything in order? Yeah, I didn't really, really start writing a lot of music until I'm 41, maybe like 10 years ago is when I really started like focusing wow. on composition. And so, but you know, I, I, I have a pretty diverse palette of things that I'm interested in, so I just, you know, tried to put that through my filter, you know, and, and so that's where those tunes came from. And I have another record that that's like about to get mastered that I'm going to put out in May of this year. I'm pretty excited about. It's a little more of like a, I have a, a band that I pre-pandemic went on a couple tours and was slowly just trying to get that off the ground before, and then the pandemic came. But, but right at the, in the middle of the pandemic, I, I, record, I documented that band. We went three days in the studio and then I spent the next year tinkering with that so more music in the works so because for me when i first listened to boomtown anti-jam got me straight away it hooked me into the album oh cool was that a conscious track to have as the start yeah that was kind of the idea that little intro beginning thing i tried to write a sticky melody or some kind of you know compositionally yeah. something that would grab you and give you something to like hold on to as some comfort and as a composer thanks for listening yeah, oh no, I, I I love it because I, mean, I love snarky, but this is not snarky. This is this is a different vibe, and it is there is so many different messages in with e- with each piece. How, as a composer, how do you title something? How do I title something? Yeah, uh, that's a that's a t- that's a tricky one because like I always I always like I have these ideas of like like sometimes it's like a cheeky title, and you're like mm, maybe. Like if my mom read that, would she be like, <laughs> would I get like a text message about that maybe? Not that I care, but I try to be respectful. Sometimes it's like the time of day. Sometimes it's where I'm at. Yeah, it just kind of varies. It's just a really interesting titles because you've got anti-jam. And, and for me, I'm, not only did the name get me, but also the, the the intro before you go into the melody. It sort of, um, yeah. it, that got me. And then you look at other ones like Jay Getty and then Morning Song, and yeah. then Profits, and then Cloaked. They're titles that make you want to know more. Yeah, a quick run, like, so for example, Cloaked. I grew up, like, my father was a star, was a Trekkie, so therefore I was a, tre- I'm a Trekkie. So Cloaked, you know, the cloaking device that yeah. the Romulans can do, so there's that, that's my little nod to, to sci-fi. Um, Anti-Jam, 
like uh, Snarky Puppy, like maybe about eight years ago or like up until about eight years ago. Like, I don't know, we were being paired with a lot of these like very jammy bands. And I was like, please, can I hear a melody? I don't want to hear like a 25 minute guitar solo. I love you, but no thanks. So that was just trying to write some music that was like the opposite of what I was felt like we were in a lot and things like that. Ahmad, I love Ahmad Jamal. He's one of my favorite musicians, period. So that was like a, a, a nod to him, you know. And the late, like late, late nights are nod to every musician around the world that has to play late nights. Yeah, you get weird. <laughs> <laughs> the woodwind texturing in this is stunning throughout the whole album. How did you layer this up? It's very detailed and very clever the way that you've textured it with all different instruments from bass, clarinet, saxophone, flutes. How did it develop from the original sort of seed, the nugget? First of all, like making a record is expensive. Like that's like hands down. I didn't realize that going into it. And I was like, oh wait, okay. I have to learn how to like get a little creative with this to get the sounds that I want. So like four of those songs on that record, either four or five were done one afternoon at a stu recording studio in Brooklyn. A couple of the other tracks were done like kind of like Legos where I booked sessions and like had like some demos and then had like a, a drummer, Nikki Glassbeat come in and play along and then had other instruments, you know, overdubbed on top. But four or five of those tunes are just like, you know, in a studio, like four human beings playing a tune and, and you know, live take. But then what I went back and did is like, you know, I love I loved like orchestration and like, you know, like lush sound sounding things like uh, like some of my favorite, like one of my favorite orchestrators, this guy named Klaus Overman. And he did all, a lot of the Jobim records and a lot of like the Bossa Nova records and a lot of really like terrible pop records too in the sixties, you know, like, you know, dinner music, things like that. But man, this guy knows how to like work. Like he would like, before there was the Mellotron, there was Klaus Overman and the way he would like write for flute choirs or strings and very sparse ways, you know, I was trying to like, cop some of that vibe and, and do that as well the live recorded music and then like coloring book it and just fill in some of the other spaces on top so so guys show them some love by downloading the album on Bandcamp, and it's called boontown by chris bullock okay well we have to get to the elephant in the room multi-award winning snarky puppy a collective of musicians who as a group I can't and probably shouldn't even try and define in any musical genre, and that's the beauty of them. So when you got the call, you mentioned that you were, you knew them in early days when you were in university in Texas. When you get the call now, do you have any idea what's actually coming? Or is it that the joy you just meet as a collective and you make music? Well, because the, the band is pretty large mm. and everyone kind of lives all over the world now, we, you know, we don't like rehearse, so to say. We'll rehearse new tunes when we're going to make a record. So we just made, we just released Empire Central yeah. that we made earlier earlier this year in Dallas. Sixteen new songs. Originally, like Mike Lee, the band leader, was going to like cut down to like eight, but then it was like, why not just release them all? So so we ended up putting out this sixteen track record. So that's the only time we get together is when we rehearse, and then sometimes like you know on a at the beginning of a tour. If we're lucky during a sound check, we might have a little bit of time to like hit little spots. But, you know, a lot of it is like, you know, relying on everybody to t do their homework and come prepared. And that happens, you know, or you learn how to lean on your friends a little bit <laughs> at certain moments and they lean on you. So it's, you know, it's give and take, but it's a fun little ecosystem to be a part of musically and creatively. You mentioned the 13th and latest album, Empire Central, which is a absolutely stunning album. And Anyone who likes Snarky will know that every album is different. And this is just, there's something beautiful about, about it because there's elements of funk, classic soul, rock, and there's the feel of, the feel list just goes on with very different sort of vibes. In Take It, featuring the late Bernard Wright, we hear a really funky track, which I find is a masterclass in musicianship with the fact, with the fat bass line anchoring the beat throughout but for me with snarky it wasn't all about sort of lots and lots of notes the gaps in the music are so spacious and during that piece you were playing the flute when did you know that you'll actually be on the flute or is it just happens organically you know like so for that that record we spent like we i think five or six days uh rehearsing you know like we'd rehearse like meet at like like 10 a.m and rehearse 
until about 10 p.m. And then we'd go back to our hotel or people's respective homes because we were in Dallas and then figure out. So it was kind of like fly by the seat of your pants. Um, we don't use charts in Snarky. Last time I got a piece of music with something written in it was in 2009 in Snarky. So lots of work for, like with demos and logic files. The kind of way we approach it is like you just kind of learn everything from the bottom up because there might be like some pad parts that might sound nice in the horns and then there might be some melodic material that might sound nice in the horns but it, it, it can change depending on the vibe and the instrumentation so we just kind of have to like learn everything which can be very daunting and there's like stressful nights where I can recall like you know being in a hotel at like 2 a.m playing my tenor as soft as possible with the hardest read I have just so I could like work on this melody or something like that you know um but so for example take it you know I think we might have experimented with like different uh, combinations of instruments and kind of wanted to like give a little nod because Nard was playing with us and the, the funk element. It just like reminded me of like some early 80s miles and with Kenny Garrett when he was in the band. And there was, I, I love some of these like, you know, these like, thankfully there's footage on YouTube of like the live clips of like Kenny and Miles where he, like Kenny's playing flute. Are you hip to those? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I was just like, let's give a little nod to Miles and Kenny and Nard's right here in the room. So and he was in that band, so it makes sense. So that that kind of like informed that decision, I think, for instrumentation. I find I've like actually found it infuriating because it had a rift in there. Dum bum 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 ba da dum. I it just goes on in my head, you know, the, the yeah. um, that that theme that comes in, and it sort of, it yeah. keeps coming back to it. So it's reinforcing everything. I just think it was so yeah. cleverly written. So you have yeah. to have a lot of trust in your fellow musicians, don't you? Because they, they don't necessarily know what you're going to do until you start layering up, do they? Yeah. And, it, you know, it's 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 an ecosystem, you know, and it's like learning when to poke your head up or like poke your head down, you know, kind of vibe. Like, and knowing that it's, yeah, it's, it's tricky. Like there's a, the second track on the, the record is called East Bay. I wrote that song. That tune, the first two days, I was like, this is definitely not making the record. And then it did, it worked out. But like the first day I was like, this sounds terrible. What, you know, it just, we have to go through that process of like, it, maybe it's sounding bad till it sounds good. They don't all just like, you know, shine. <laughs> so when you, when like you wrote that. that track, what did you actually score? What did you, for everybody to hear? And then, as you say, it's, it becomes, it's organic. Were you hearing something of an, of an end result that wasn't there to start with? Well, I think it's just, it's tricky because it doesn't start on the downbeat and the first part's in seven. And it's like, it's written to be deceptive. Cause like, you know, I, I love music that is full of surprises. <laughs> I just like surprises maybe in life. And so I like to write that sometimes in, into music. And sometimes it's not like the easiest thing. You can't just like jump in the water. You have to figure out, okay, how do I get to the water first? So we had to figure that out and find a way to make that groove and for everyone to like feel it or count it and there's a couple other tunes on the record that, that are just the same you know they're just like oh god i'm holding on for dear life here it goes you know like belmont this ballad yeah. you know it's it's a really tricky one to play to make it sound really light and loose because it's like you have to be so exact so relaxed and the people who know snarky know that you are such a tight group you have to understand everything about the music before you perform it because as a horn section when you've got how i mean sometimes you're there's three of you isn't there and then some up to four up, up to, to four, four yeah. yeah or and and then we have you know justin hiding in the keyboard section that can pick yeah. up the trumpet and paste it too so then there could be five so you know but that's that's rare to have all of us in the same room yeah usually we travel with like three horns that's still a big section to be really tight, but that just comes to trust and knowing the charts, isn't it? Yeah, and we've also been playing. I mean, I've been playing with a, a, a lot of these guys for, you know, like since 2006. So we've got a lot of history, a lot of like, you know, there's a lot of like unsaid things that are happening, you know, like we don't, you know, we talk about like pretty specific about like, you know, where we're gonna breathe, where, where are you hearing this melody, things like that, but like it, it evolves. And so, like, you know, we kind of just move together, thankfully, because we have that time on our side. So moving on, Chris, I've got a couple of questions to ask you from uh, sure. that, that have come in via social media. One from a Jamie Lloyd in London who writes, I love Snarky. Can you ask Chris what it's like to create the huge sound with the Metropole Orchestra? My favorite album is Silver. That was a, like a really special album because uh, I don't know. I, I really love that um, record that Laura Mabula did with the Metropole Orchestra, Sing to the Moon. 
never in my mind I thought we would be playing with them, you know. So when that opportunity presented itself, it was like, a, you know, getting to be in a room with that many people making vibrations and sounds in one accord is a special thing, you know. And Snarky's already a big band. And then let's just add like 40, 50 other people to that sound and like, you know, yeah, it was a, a really beautiful experience. It was texturally wonderful in, in introducing all those extra string sections. And it didn't take away from Snarky being that Snarky. It was almost this sort of marriage of equals, which was yeah. wonderful. Yeah, I mean, the Metropole Orchestra is like a really, really special group. You know, I, I don't know of many orchestras in the world that can groove like they do in a variety of uh, musical environments. You know, we've we've done the, the Silva music with a couple other orchestras that will remain unnamed. And it was like sad. <laughs> like shockingly sad the lack of like just care that a music like someone would sit down and they just look at the clock wait until that rehearsal's over hang the bow break time you know like these like union orchestras it was yeah. like what the hell so the metropole is a special thing you know was the the vibe actually playing with a group of musicians like that different just because they understood the groove they understood the what you were trying to achieve yeah and we got to do it a couple of times we didn't just do the record in one performance like we we did like a little mini tour with the metropole too and which was really fun just because it was like that's a lot of people checking into a hotel at one time it's pretty <laughs> hilarious you know things like that it's just like a fun crew of people to, to hang with and and i ended up making you know like some what is now like lifelong friends from like making that playing get to play music with them every time i go to holland we hang out Moving on to Alice Wooten from Minneapolis, who asks, and oh, see, she's a Jacob Collier fan here. When you did Don't You Know from Family Dinner Volume 2, which featured mm -hmm. Jacob Collier, he was so young then. Did you know at the time he was going to become the phenomenon he has? I can't predict the future, but uh, he's a talented dude, and he's uh, he's got a lot of music and, and life in, in him. So sure, it's kind of obvious. That was a fun record to make, too. Yeah, it's it's great. It's a, a long, it's a long track. The one that he was on, isn't it? The uh, don't you know mm -hmm. goes goes on. Yeah, extended solo, right? It's been a long time since I've listened to that record. I don't often revisit the stuff we do unless I have to like relearn something. <laughs> <laughs> but he must have been probably twenty then. That's quite young, isn't it? To guess with Snarky. Sure. Yeah. I mean, he, the, the music, his musicianship speaks for itself. And you know, some I think sometimes too, and with the way our culture and our society, we get so like we put this pedestal of someone's age. And get to become a, more obsessed with the age than the actual like art. He's been making art from a very young age, so I think that's more important to, to like focus on. I think you know, or or whatever. But to each their own, you know. Oh no! Here, here, here! You know, if the if a person's got talent and ability, I'm not talking here about uh, mechanical ability. In other words, the ability to play fast. Someone's got soul. Yeah. Someone's got soul. Someone can convey a narrative. It doesn't matter what age yeah. they are. Yeah, totally. I know you're a busy guy, Chris, but I have to ask you one last question. What does 2023 and beyond post-Brazil look like for Chris Bullock? Well, thankfully, I'm busy with Snarky a lot this next, this upcoming year. We've got a lot of touring just because because we, we just put out Empire Central. And so 2023 will be a busy year for, for my Snarky activities. We've got like some South America, some Asia, Australia, more Europe dates, more US dates, Central America. So that, that'll be cool. Um, I'm going to release... My second record in May, that's the plan, on Ground Up Music. I'm just finishing up the artwork and things like that. And I'm gonna, you know, attempt to potentially like take my own group back out on the road some somehow, some way, somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's uh, that, that aspect of like being a musician and trying to develop a new project and get like warm bodies into a room with ears that wanna listen takes some time you know i mean like for example like you know with snarky we spent many years playing for nobody you know or like you know and then it slowly incrementally built so like you know again trying to like build some more of my own like solo stuff so things like that working on some music with a few other people as well so a little variety of things and when so, you're on tour what do you do to chill or do you or are you constantly uh, thinking music you know my favorite like over the last couple of years i've gotten really into running and I always like look at them when I get to a new city, it's always a fun like little like map my route. How many bridges can I go over today? Or can I run along a beach or some kind of waterway? So I, I, I like, you know, and it's plus it's just like a nice way to just get away from everyone and have a little alone time. Cause I feel like that's really important for like the amount of touring. Like I just did a six week tour a couple months ago with, with Snarky across Europe and the UK. And you know, that the alone time is really important. It's like, you gotta preserve that, like just for sanity's sake, you know? 
because it's uh sometimes it can feel like like on the road that like i'm living in the circus and when you're so. running do you think what do you think of do you try not to do, are you there looking at what you're going past what's going on i think like as I, i've gotten older i'm trying to become a little more zen and be in the moment here right now you know because like that that'll come and that's back there so it's like trying to just be present where i'm at it's usually a pretty nice way to like experience a new place and that's the same with being a musician isn't it you always have to be in the moment otherwise otherwise it all goes wrong yeah yeah we can get ahead of ourselves sometimes and make funny mistakes or make odd choices things like that yeah being being present and trying to be open to communicate and listen to the people around you things like that and how hard do you find that now when you're on tour even though you're on tour you know everything you're playing you still have to be in the moment don't you do you find that gets easier the older you get or is that harder i think it's just like learning how to accept where i'm at that day because some days you know like i i, I love like being on tour and playing music every night but you can't like hit a home run every night or whatever analogy you want to use so it's just trying to be open and flexible and not stuck in like well this is the way i play this song and i only do it this way it's like being open to like other ideas and other influences, you know? And uh, th that kind of sentiment usually like allows more creativity and more fun, I think. Well, I love the fact that you don't have a uh, sax player's chops on the flute. You can actually play classically and you can play, <laughs> you can play Told with you. a you Hubie Laws. You. <laughs> <laughs> you can play with a Hubie Laws type sound. You, you mess around with that sound on the flute and it's, it's infuriating for us classical players because it's sax players, shouldn't be able to play like that i don't know i you know it's funny like four years ago three or four years ago i decided i woke up one day i was like i'm gonna become a flute player i'm gonna stop being this like faux flute player and i, f I finally feel like i'm starting to scratch the surface a little bit you know and just make it to where i you know can pick it up I, and then now i've like expanded my family like i have a bass flute sitting on the bed in there i have a piccolo down here gosh why i own a piccolo i don't know but it's fun it's a party horn can sit on top of everything there's some piccolo on the new snarky record too on a track called bet it's a brazilian like kind of fojo kind of vibe and uh yeah i was like i'm gonna get piccolo on this record and sure enough <laughs> <laughs> well it certainly works because tonally it shocked me on the the last snarky one just the the sound the purity of the sound it, and you cleverly inserted some vibrato in there that whoa what's that you know, it is. It was a beautiful, oh, wow. beautiful flute sound. So, yeah. And then you, and then you can effortly go over to the saxophone. Then you go over to the clarinet, and it's going to be piccolo soon. You just think, oh, your chops must be so flexible. Well, from week to week, it varies, right? I don't know. I just took a week off, and then I picked up the instruments a couple of days ago, and it was like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes that's good. I think it's good to just step step away from the music a little bit to give yourself some time to just be. You know, I don't know, like. Okay, well, baritone sax to the death whistle, piccolo. I draw the line. I don't play Barry. No Barry for me. Tenor's yeah. as low as oh, I go. Oh, yeah, but someone would have, <laughs> somebody would have said that about the piccolo. If I'd said to you a few years ago when I first met you, how about the piccolo? I'm sure you would have laughed. Yeah, well, stranger things have happened, I'm sure. Who knows? <laughs> Chris, Chris, thank you so much for joining us on Talking Flutes this week. From your pad in Brazil for the next couple of months hoping that you'll get lots of inspiration both in visual and auditory and kinesthetic gustatory using yeah. all the five senses and that 2023 turns into a brilliant year for you creatively as, as well as personally obviously thanks appreciate you having me and thank you all for listening this week and wishing you a musically fulfilling week ahead and may your high b be especially in tune because mine never is Goodbye. <laughs>
Talking Flutes and Talking Flutes Extra are podcast productions by the Trevor James Flute Company. For more information, visit trevorjamesflutes.com.